pep talk. And uh, we said, kids, to our five kids in the car, we said, hey, when we get there, don't run in the house, don't jump on their furniture, don't eat too fast, uh, no, no burping, no burping competitions, they're pretty good at that. And we said, you can't do that here. Uh, you need to say thank you, you need to say please, you need to have a good attitude, and try not to break anything. And if you do, you need to come tell. So we're just going through all the basics, walking through everything. You need to get your act together, kids. And so we show up, and it's a very nice house, one of the nicest houses I've probably ever been in, and it's a really beautiful day. So the husband and I were standing outside, we're having a good conversation, I'm getting to know him. And then this happened. So I'm going to show you a video about what happened, and I need to let you know in advance, no one was injured in the making of this video, and, um, but you need to remember the scenario. We barely know these people. We've only been here for a few minutes, and what you're going to see is my kids running with their kids. So if you want to play that uh, video, that'd be great. <laughs> Here it is again. I'll just take a look. It's worth the wait. Here we go. Now, <laughs> I was standing in the, part, or in the driveway, and we watched that happen. I'm standing right next to the, the dad, and we watched this happen. Now, as a dad, naturally, I needed to do a little analysis on this video. So if you want to go to this picture, uh, I think we have a picture up here. Or maybe we don't. Is the PowerPoint working here? No PowerPoint? <laughs> maybe not. Did it freeze? All right, that's no problem. But this is what happens in the video. I'll just describe it. What happens in the video when you look at it is that he leads with his knee, and then he leads with his head, and his head is exploding through, <laughs> through the glass. And what happens as a result is that the glass, it goes into a million pieces. Like a mi I mean, I bet you literally a million pieces. It took six adults over one hour to clean up all of the glass, and it was so awkward. It was so incredibly awkward. We don't know these people. We're picking up glass, broken glass that is literally everywhere. It's a custom all glass door that we just smashed. And after like 15 minutes of pure silence, uh, I had to say something, so I took a risk. And I looked at the guy and I said, well, at least we left our mark on your house. <laughs> And he looks at me, and he just says, leave. <laughs> I'm just joking. He didn't say that, but that's what it felt like. I thought he might do that, but he didn't. He laughed, and we had a good time. But it was so awkward. It was so uncomfortable. My kids were a little bit embarrassed. I was a little bit embarrassed. And by the grace of God, we made it, th we made it through. Now, the point is that there are times in your life, over the course of your life, where you're not going to make the impression you want to make. There are times when you're going to look bad, you're going to look foolish, you're going to feel dumb, you're going to feel embarrassed, and it's inevitable. You can't control it. There's just going to be times when it just happens. And one thing I know about you as a human being is that you want to avoid looking bad. You want to avoid looking foolish. You want to avoid running through people's all glass door. I mean, you don't want to do, you don't want to step into anything that is going to make you look dumb. But if you look at church history, this is what you will see you will see that to be a Christian is to risk ruining your reputation. That if you become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is to voluntarily step into a space where the world will call you foolish. The world will call you dumb. So to follow Christ is to risk looking bad in the world. And this is a problem because we love our reputation. This is why you think about what other people think about you. This is why you care about how you look. This is why you care about how you dress. This is why you care about your 
clothing. This is why you care about the way you appear to other people. And so when you are in a space where you, you feel like you don't look good or you feel like you look like a fool or you feel, like, uh, you feel a sense of shame, it's very uncomfortable and we want to avoid it. But at the same time, to follow Christ often means that you follow him not only into his blessing, but you follow him into his shame. It is to voluntarily put yourself in a position where you experience the blessing and the shame that Christ experienced in the world. It is to follow Christ voluntarily into pain, into discomfort, into looking bad according to the world. And this is one of the main points that the Apostle Paul is making in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is what he says in verse 18. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The gospel of grace is the foundation of Christianity. And the gospel of grace is foolishness in the world. So for you to base your life on the Lord Jesus Christ is to position yourself to be a fool in the eyes of the world. You risk being labeled a fool or even something worse. So here's the question. If following Christ, if believing the gospel, if preaching the gospel means you risk losing your reputation, you risk looking like a fool, then why would you ever follow Christ? And for the, the answer for many people is, I just won't. I'm just going to stay quiet. I'm just going to blend in with the crowd. I'm just going to keep my mouth closed because I, I don't like the experience of being labeled a fool, a moron, a bigot, whatever it is. So you just stay silent. And so this question, why follow Christ if it's going to get you into trouble, is one of the questions Paul's answering in our text. So 1 Corinthians 1.18, he says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to us who are being saved. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the, of the wise, and I will set aside the intelligence of the intelligent. Then he says in verse 20, where is the one who is wise? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? Paul says, when the world calls you foolish... They are standing in a position of wisdom. The world will call itself wisdom. This is not just true about American culture. This has been true over the last 2,000 years of world history. That when the world calls you a fool for following Christ, they're standing in a position where they call themselves wise. And so Paul says this. He says, what you need to do as a Christian is you need to look at the world. You need to take a long, hard look at the world. Those who call themselves wise. And you need to ask yourself the question, the people who call Christians fools and the gospel foolish, are those people truly wise? Are they truly wise? And are you truly a fool for following Christ? And Paul's answer is this, that God has made the world's wisdom foolish. Now, where do you see the foolishness of the world? Where do you see the foolishness of the world? Well, In our passage, there are two places you're going to see the foolishness of the world. The first place is in the quest for life. It is in the quest quest for life. Every human being has a deep desire for life. And when I say life, I mean much more than just physically being alive. Inside of you, you have a desire for more than bread and water. You desire more than just simply breathing and being alive. Inside of your soul, you have a deep desire desire, a human desire for life and satisfaction and meaning. You want real joy in your life. That's what you want. And from this human desire comes a lie. And here's the lie. This is one of the most pervasive lies in the world, and it's everywhere. It doesn't get communicated this way, but this is what the lie is. The lie is that gratifying my desires will equal life. So how do you find real life? How do you find real joy? How do you find real satisfaction? It's relatively easy according to the world. Just gratify your desires. If you can gratify your desires, if you can fulfill your desires, then you will have real life. If you can just accomplish your dreams, then you'll have real life. Now, all of us have a variety of different desires. And these desires, they 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 get played out in a variety of different areas of life. And so from this variety of desires and a variety of different areas of life, 
comes this equation. It is a strategy for life. All of us have this equation. All of us have some sort of plan about how we're going about finding our life. So you can just stop for a minute and ask yourself the question, what is your plan to find real joy? What is your plan to find real life? Isn't that what you want? You want real life. You want real joy. And inside you have some sort of strategy, some sort of plan for fulfilling that that satisfaction. And so I'm just going to give you an example of what I think is some very common factors in the equation on how to find life. The first one is sex. This is a little dial where what people want is sexual fulfillment, where the lie in our mind is this. If I'm going to be really happy, I must have sexual gratification. I need to have the type of sex that I want to have or the type of sexual fulfillment that I want to have. That's factor number one. Now, over the years, I've learned that factor number two is also sex for most people. This is what it is. It's, I got to have sex, sexual gratification, and it's more than that. I need to have romance and drama and everything that I want that is wrapped up with this. This is what I need. And if I don't have it, I don't have life. And then from there comes friends. I need to have the right type of friends. If I don't have the right type of friends, I won't have life. And then I need to have some sort of health. I need to be healthy. And then I need some sort of hobbies. I need to fulfill my desires in the area of my hobbies. And then my family. And this is not in any particular order, but you need to have a healthy family. If your family life is not good, don't you feel a sense of angst in your soul? Like, I need to get my family situation figured out. And then I need a career. Or I need success in school. Or maybe... Uh, for a lot of people, you get to a place where you need cats. I don't know if you know any people like this, but this happens to a lot of people. Like, you need the right number of cats in your life. Or dogs. Like, you need to, you need to have dogs. Cats and dogs. And then you need to find a spouse. And once you find your spouse, then you'll be happy. And then you need to have the right amount of kids. Like Evan said, 2.5 kids. Is that what it was? You need 2.5 kids. And then you'll be really happy. Then you need the right amount of money. And then you need the right amount of vacations and vacation times. And you need the right amount of possessions. And what each of these factors, and you can add a lot of factors here, but each of these factors have a dial on it. And what most people spend the majority of their time doing in life is just adjusting the dial on these factors in order to arrive at real life. So we say, I need more romance. I need more success. I need more, m- more fame. I need whatever it is. I need to have kids. I need to have X, Y, and Z. And the majority of people spend the majority of their lives simply adjusting the dials. But have you ever thought seriously about that strategy? Have you ever thought seriously about that strategy? Have you ever considered the fact that the people who have the type of body that you want people who have the type of money that you want and the type of career that you want and the type of family that you are aiming at, have you ever considered the fact that oftentimes those people are deeply unsatisfied? That they are, they are continuing to adjust all the dials just like you're adjusting the dial. So once you get one thing, you just move on to the next thing. And then you get that thing and then you move on to the next thing. And then you have that thing and you move on to the next thing. And so it's this endless quest of life. And I think deep down in our souls, we know that this is a bad strategy for finding life. But we pursue the strategy anyways. One philosopher said, I think he's right about this, he says, everyone knows that money won't make you happy, but everybody wants to find that out for themselves. Everybody knows it. And everybody knows that romance ultimately will not make you happy, but everybody wants to find that out for themselves. And everybody knows that the right family, the right career, the right amount of fame, the right amount of whatever it is, fill in the blank, will not make you happy. But everyone wants to find that out for themselves. And so the Apostle Paul, he says, the world, the wisdom of the world is utter foolishness. Those who call themselves wise, the ones who call you fools for being a Christian are the same people who are pursuing this same type of approach to find life, and they'll never find it. And in our world today, uh, because of technology, which obviously technology and the internet, all that stuff, that, all, of, all of that that goes along with technology and the internet has been pretty much a good thing. 
But what it has done is it has made gratifying your desires much easier. It's much easier to gratify your desires quickly now. Like you can do whatever you want more quickly than, you, than ever in the history of the world. You know, communication, you want to communicate with people, it's instant. You want to get your news, it's instant. You buy something on Amazon and you get it the next day. I was not on Amazon a couple days ago or a couple weeks ago. I've had this experience before, but I ordered something and they said, they said typically it will ship within five business days. And I was deeply offended by that. I thought to myself, like, what are you talking, I'm not an animal here. Like, you make, you're going to make me wait five days? That's not acceptable because Amazon is just next day, next day, next day, or even food. Food. When I was growing up, my mom would use crock pots all the time. You guys use crock pots? Have you, you grow up with crock pots? Yeah. It's good. It's good. You throw some, some chicken and beans and whatever you're going to throw in there and you let it sit all day. But then they came out with Instapots. Do you guys know what those are? They're incredible. They're absolutely incredible. It's like magic. It, 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 yes, that's right. It expedites the process. You know, you put a chicken in there, like a whole live chicken in the Instapot, and 30 minutes later, you have lasagna. I don't know how it works, but it, it, it works. It expedites the process, and this is what we're doing. It's just constantly quicker, 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 gratify your desires, gratify your desires. And what's happening in the world is that people keep adjusting the dials. They keep getting the things that they want, the possessions that they want. But you know what's happening in our country today? is that people are more empty than they've ever been in the history of our country. They are more dissatisfied. They are more depressed. They're more confused, even though we have more access to gratifying our desires. And the reason it is confusing, the reason it's depressing, is because there's no life in the world. There's none. You put your hope in sex, you put your hope in success, you put your hope in family, you put your hope in money, you put your hope in whatever you put your hope in. And what you're going to realize pretty quickly is that at the bottom of your pursuit is nothing but gravel. It is empty. Things, things like sex, money, family, all that stuff, they're fine in and of themselves, but they are not God and you've not been created for them. Human beings have been created by God and for God. Therefore, you will never find rest for your soul until you find your rest in the person of Jesus Christ. You will never find satisfaction in your soul until you find your satisfaction in Christ because you have been created by Christ and you have been created for Christ. And this is why Jesus came into the world. John 10.10 10 says, A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, and I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. Jesus came into the world so that you could know real life. Because that life is not in the world, it is only in Christ. And so the first place, if you want to see the foolishness of the world, the first place to look is in the quest for life. What the world says, you sh how the world says you should go about finding life. The second place to find the foolishness of the world is in the quest for God. The quest for God. How do you know that the world, the wit, quote wisdom of the world is actually foolish, foolishness? You see it in the quest for God. Verse 21, it says, For since in God's wisdom the world did not know God through wisdom. So God who created all things, who created you, he has set it up so that through the wisdom of the world you will never know God. You've been created for God. You've been created by God. You've been created for God. But you will never know God through the wisdom of the world. How helpful is the wisdom of the world? It can't give you life. You'll never know God through the wisdom of the world. This is what he says. For since in God's wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom. So here's the question. If life is found in Christ, if you've been created by God and for God and life is in Christ, then how does someone come to know this Jesus Christ? How do you come to know God? Well, Paul's going to answer the question. For since in God's wisdom, the world did not know God through wisdom... God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is preached. So the world looks at the gospel and says, that message is stupid, it's nonsense, you're a fool if you give your life to it. Paul says, I don't care what the world says because the world is not wise. The world has no life. And because God is saving people through this message that the world calls foolish. God, is, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is preached. God has set it up so that this message that the world calls foolish 
bigoted, stupid, hateful, nonsensical. This is the way that people come to know Christ. And see, whenever the gospel of grace goes out, there will be two responses. Verse 18, for the word, word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Those who are lost and dead in their sin, just like some of you here tonight, you're going to hear the message and you'll say, Christ finding life in Christ, nonsense. Paul says, for the word of the cross, it is foolishness to those who are perishing. But there's another response, but it is the power of God to us who are being saved. That the gospel is the power of God to us who are being saved. <clears throat> Some of you, when you hear the gospel, your heart lights up. Some of you, when you hear about Christ, you say, Christ is the power of God. Christ is our Redeemer. Christ is our Savior. He's our God. He's our King. To us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Some conclude the gospel is nonsense, and some conclude that the gospel is the truth. And when someone comes to believe the truth of the gospel, their life is turned upside down because they are reconciled to God. They are forgiven. They're made new. They're made righteous by the grace of God and therefore they are transformed just like Evan was sharing earlier. His life turned upside down. Why? Through this message that the world calls foolish. Through the gospel of grace. Of grace. So remember our question. That if following Christ means you risk looking bad in the world, then why follow Christ? Why preach the gospel? Well, the first reason, Paul would say, is that the world is not wise. Look at the world. Look, just look at the people in the world who say they're wise. They don't know up from down, left from right. Look at the world. Look at the, their approach to life. Do they really have life? Are they deeply satisfied? Are they full of joy? Look at the world. The world is not wise. So Paul says, don't listen to what they have to say. The second reason is that there is life in Christ. There's no life in the world, and there is life in the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't worry about what the world thinks about you. The world has nothing to offer you. It has nothing for you. This is what the scriptures would teach. It will give you fun experiences, but at the bottom of those experiences... It's emptiness. It's regret. And many of you have had that experience. You've gotten what you wanted, and you say, it doesn't satisfy. There's got to be more. There's got to be more. The world has nothing for us. The world is beautiful because it's created by God, but it will never satisfy us the way we've been designed to be satisfied in Christ. The third reason to keep believing keep following, keep preaching the gospel is because God uses the preaching of the gospel to transform lives. For the last 2,000 years, literally millions of people have come, I mean, every year, millions of people have come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And they've been changed. That they've been made a new person. And so the message of the gospel, though it will be rejected by many, it is the power of God. It changes people. So Paul says in verse 21, For since in God's wisdom the, wor the world did not know God through wisdom, God was pleased. I love that. God, what pleases God? It's, it pleases God to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is preached. For Jews ask for signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block for the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. Yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because God's foolishness, God is not foolish, but according to the standards of the world. Because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And God's weakness is stronger than human strength. And so Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. And we'll keep preaching Christ crucified. So what is this message that some people hear and reject? What is this message that some people can't pay attention to? What is this message that some people think is foolish? And what is this message that changes people's lives? What is this message? Well, there's a clue in the text. Verse 23 says, but we preach Christ crucified. At the heart of this message, the message of the gospel, is a crucified Messiah. A crucified Christ. It is the cross of Christ. And so, I just want to give you two truths about this message. The first truth about what the gospel says is that the gospel says you are more sinful than you can imagine. 
You are more sinful than you can imagine. By birth and by choice, you have sinned against God. You've been created in his image, and you were dearly loved by God. But at the same time, you have to understand that the penalty of your sin is death, that one day you will stand in the presence of a holy God, and on that day you will see the holiness of God, you'll see the righteousness of God, you will see the mercy of God, you will see the love of God, and you will be called to give an account for what you did today. And on that day, you will be exposed as a sinner. That is what will happen. I mean, think about it for a moment. If you have to give an account for what you did today and what you did yesterday and every day before that, you just think about your record. Think about that day. You will be exposed as a sinner. Have you ever told a lie before? The answer is yes. What does that make you? A liar. It makes you a liar. Have you ever stolen anything before? What does that make you? Some people say a stealer, a Pittsburgh stealer. The word is a thief. That's actually the word. It makes you a thief. Have you ever lusted in your heart? Have you ever sexually lusted in your heart? After another person? What does that make you? It makes you an adulterer. Have you ever hated anyone in your heart? Like right now, do you hate somebody? Jesus says you're guilty of committing murder. And see, it's our sin that makes us guilty before God. And oftentimes we don't see and experience the problem of our sin because we live among one another and and we compare ourselves to one another. And what we say is, well, everybody sins. Like, that's true. Everyone in this room, we have sinned. And we think to ourselves, well, I'm not, my sin isn't that big of a deal because I know other really sinful people. Like, I'm not as sinful as that person or that person. I'm not as bad as that person. And I go to church sometimes and I say I believe in God. And I have this like cross necklace around my neck. And like, I'm, so I'm probably okay. And we feel good about our position. But I want you to imagine just for a moment, I want you to imagine that everyone on planet Earth uh, was lined up. I know this, is, this analogy doesn't actually work because there's not enough space. But just imagine everyone is lined up on the beaches in California. Every human being, single file. And what everyone's there to do is to compete in a jumping competition. So you're gonna see how far you can jump into the ocean, just one after another. You're just gonna jump into the ocean, one after another, and you're gonna see who has the the farthest jump. And what's gonna happen? Some people are gonna run, 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 and they're gonna jump 10 feet into the ocean. Some people are gonna run, 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 jump 20 feet into the ocean. Some people are gonna run, 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 and then trip and fall and not really get into the ocean but there's gonna be a wide variety of experiences there. And what happens to a lot of people is they're able to jump 15 feet into the ocean. And they look around and they're like, look at these people behind me. They jumped 12 feet and 15, you know, 14 feet and three feet and that person didn't even jump at all, they tripped. And therefore, I'm better than half the people. I'm, 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 I'm kind of like, I'm about like 60%. I'm a better than about 60% of the people and so I'm, I'm doing okay. And there is a relative difference among people in that scenario on the beach if you run, 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 jump into the ocean. There is a relative difference. And this is how we think about our moral standing. We compare ourselves to one another. We compare ourselves to people online. We compare ourselves to bad people that we know. And we say, I'm relatively better than them. But this ignores the standard of God. I mean, what is the standard of God to go to heaven instead of hell? Have you ever thought about that question? What is the standard? What's the line between heaven and hell? A right relationship with God and no relationship with God. Well, God's standard is not that you would be able to jump 25 feet into the ocean or 30 feet into the ocean or 100 feet into the ocean. In this analogy, God's standard is that you would be able to jump from the beaches in California to Hawaii. You have to jump that far. And when you understand that is God's standard for a relationship, God's standard for heaven instead of hell, what you begin to realize is that we're all in the same condition. We're all equally hopeless. None of us can meet the standard of God. And if you die without Christ, you'll die in your sin. If you die in your sin, you're worthy of hell. But isn't God merciful? Doesn't God just overlook our sin? Well, the truth of the scriptures is that because God is merciful and loving, 
every sin will be punished by death. Every, every sin will be punished by death. And if we get what we deserve, we will go to hell. And the longer I follow Christ, the more convinced I am that I'm worthy of hell. That's what I'm worthy of. The more I know my own heart, the more I see, oh man, I am so proud. I'm so impatient. There are things about me that I think, oh Lord, if you kept a record of my sin, I could never stand. And so the gospel teaches us that we're more sinful than you could ever imagine. And the gospel teaches us that we are more loved than you could ever imagine. You could ever imagine. It's incredible. The love of God is an eternal love that though we are sinful and we deserve hell, Jesus Christ came into the world and he became a man. That the second person of the Trinity took on humanity so that Christ is truly God and truly man. And see, he came into the world to live the righteous life that God requires of you. God requires perfection from you in order to go to heaven. He requires perfection of you in order to have a right relationship with him. And you say, no, no, but nobody's perfect. Exactly. That means we're all condemned. You say, well, how does that work? Well, think about the Garden of Eden. How many times did Adam and Eve sin before the world fell into sin? One time over a piece of fruit. God's standard is total and complete righteousness. And Christ, the good news is that Christ came into the world to live the righteous life that God requires of us. Or in other words, the Lord Jesus came into the world to jump from California to Hawaii on our behalf. To accomplish the righteousness of God on our behalf. And he met the standard of perfection for humanity. He was totally righteous in every way. Everything he did was right and good and holy. Everything he did was full of love and mercy. He, he fulfilled the law to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And he did that every day of his existence. Now, what did Jesus get for his perfect life? What did he get? What did he earn? We have earned hell, but what did Jesus earn? He earned eternal life. Jesus Christ is the only human being who's ever lived who earned a right relationship with God because he met God's standard of perfection. So he earned eternal life, but what did he get for his perfect life? Crucifixion. And so Paul says in verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified. At the center of this gospel message is a crucified Christ. Now, he didn't stay in the grave. Three days later, he rose from the grave. But if you're, if you're going to understand the offense of the gospel, the stumbling block of the gospel, you must understand what the cross is about. That there at the cross, the sinless, spotless Son of God bore your sin. I mean, think about what he carried at the cross. He carried your guilt and my guilt, the guilt of the world, because the wages of sin is death. See, every lie will be paid for by death. All of your lying before a holy God demands death. All of your porn activity before a holy God demands that you die. All of your hatred towards people and your bitterness and your pride and your selfishness, all of it demands death because God is a God of love. He is a God of righteousness. And so there at the cross, Jesus is taking into himself the sin of the world. He is becoming legally responsible for pedophilia. He's becoming legally responsible for committing adultery and murder. He's he is becoming legally responsible for selling drugs. He's becoming legally responsible for the sins of the world. And there at the cross, he bled and died that we might be forgiven. Because when the wrath of God was poured out on Christ, our punishment was accomplished in him. And so now God can offer forgiveness to the world through the, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, why did Jesus do this? It's because of his eternal love for you. Paul says in Romans 5, for while we were still, still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. 
For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us. Do you ever doubt whether or not God loves you? Do you ever question whether or not God really loves you? Paul says, God has proven his love by doing something for you before you were born. That God proves his love, his own love for us, in that while we were still sinners, when we deserved it the least, at the height of our rebellion against God, this is when God sent his son into the world to die. And see, when, when the truth of the gospel lands in your heart and you realize that Jesus is on the cross for me, then the love of God comes alive. He went there for me. He died for me. He rose for me. That at the cross, he met my greatest need. He had to pay for my forgiveness. And so now, there is forgiveness and reconciliation available to the world in Christ. There is real life available to the world in Christ because the barrier of sin has been removed. The door between God and man has been kicked open by the Son, God, Jesus Christ. And now everyone who wants life and forgiveness and reconciliation can come. You can come. If you want to know God, you can know him in Christ. If you want life, you can know him in Christ. That's good news. <laughs> that, you want life? That's why you've been created. You can know him. And see, Christ, Christ, not, not only did the Lord Jesus Christ live a righteous life, he died in our place. And so what that means is that the righteousness of Christ is given to all who would have faith in Christ. You're given a standing that you have not earned. You're clothed with the very righteousness of Christ. You're made a child of God. You're given the Holy Spirit. And you're reconciled back to God. The, the barrier of sin, the door between God and man has been kicked open. So everyone who wants to come can come. Now some of you think the idea of finding Christ or finding life in Christ is pure fo foolishness. It's utter foolishness. You're just here for the food tonight, and that's great. Like, that's great. I think, are we having food tonight? I think we are. Okay. So that's, that's great, and we want you here. That's wonderful. But you think it's foolishness. And some of you, when you hear about Christ, your heart explodes with joy. Because this message is the message of life. It, it's the best news you've ever heard. And some of you don't know what to think. But you're interested. And so I would encourage you, if you're interested in Christ, you don't even know what to think, I would encourage you to just take some steps to read the scriptures, to have conversations, to figure it out. For 2,000 years, people's lives have been turned upside down by this message. And this is a wonderful time in your life to figure out what you believe is true about the most important person in the history of the world. About the Lord Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis once said, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. If, if Jesus didn't really live and really die and really rise from the dead, it's of no importance. And if it's true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. And so I would encourage you, if your heart is at a place where you say, I, need, I want the life that God has created me to have in Christ, then you should repent and believe. If you don't know what to think, take steps. Just pray, God, would you speak to me? I'll read your word. I'm open to finding out who you are. And I'm telling you, if you're willing, the Lord will change your life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you for your goodness to us. We thank you for how gracious you've been to us. And I just, I ask God for people here tonight who don't know you, I just ask God you would open their eyes, that the gospel would be good news to them. And people who are intrigued by the gospel, they would at least be willing to have an open mind. They would at least be willing to have conversations. And to those who think the gospel is just pure foolishness, God, open their eyes. Help them to see the reality and the glory of Christ. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.